PokerStatic.com. We bring you the interviews you want to hear. Now with your host, Brett Oliverio and Eric Bickle, the Poker Static Hot Seat. What's up? Welcome to the Poker Static Hot Seat. Brett Oliverio with Eric Bickle. And joining us tonight, Antonio Espandiari. Of course, you can follow him on Twitter, at Magic Antonio. And I was thinking about your Twitter handle, Antonio. Like, you're a professional poker player. Uh, you, now you're, you, you do commentary and analysis for ESPN. I guess you're, you're not much of a, a, a magician anymore. Is this correct? Um, I guess there's some truth to that statement, but I think once a magician, always a magician kind of a thing. Uh, early on in my life, I started doing magic mostly because, you know, I wasn't a very popular kid and I had trouble with the girls and whatnot. And so <laughs> magic kind of opened the door for me. Uh, definitely taught me how not to be so shy and whatnot. And so, you know, as it progressed, it, I never planned on it being my career. It turned out to be that I was a professional magician for a couple of years. And then once I discovered poker, magic kind of went on the back burner. Now I still do it for friends and, you know, social environments here and there, but not nearly as much as I used to. So, you know, I guess in a way you could say that I'm still a magician, but not really a practicing magician. Are you, so uh, can you be hired? Will you do a corporate gig for the right amount of cash? My fee has gone up a lot for magic shows, I'll tell you that. I used to, well, I, I remember when I used to do magic for a living, I charged uh, about $300 for one hour to come and do close-up magic and just kind of walk around corporate events and things like that. Right. And so you'd have to book for at least at least two hours. Um, it would be about 500 basically per booking. So if you wanted to get me today, I think the the price would be... <laughs> A little bit higher than that. <laughs> I'm thinking you 20k. 20k. Will you show up for 20k? Is it some kids bar mitzvah or no? No way. 50k. I never did kids parties, but for 20k, for 20k, I'm showing up at most places. I mean, you know, 20k is 20k. <laughs> right. <laughs> but but, you know, but, but I imagine now when I do. Go ahead, Anthony. When I when I do appearances and whatnot, my my agent manager when he books things like that. And they were more popular a few years ago when, you know, we weren't in such a recession and whatnot. You know, they hired me as a poker player, but I always did magic tricks for the people and for their, you know, big clients or whatever. So I still do it. Yeah, I was going to say, I have to imagine you get offers to, you know, play poker with some with businessmen or at a corporate function. Um, how often do those offers offers come along to you? Well, you get different offers all day, every day. Uh, you just don't know uh, which ones are legit and which ones are not. And so, for that reason, I, I you know, I have a, a an agent, Brian Ballsba, who who is also agent to a lot of different big poker players. And so, anytime somebody comes at me with anything, I just kind of send it over to him, so I don't have to deal with it. But you know, just in life and whatnot, you meet a lot of guys that want to gamble with you, and so. You know, it, it really kind of just depends on how you meet that person. Right. You know, I might meet a guy through a mutual friend who I know is a very wealthy gentleman who just wants to play heads up poker with me at his house or whatever. OK, no problem. But if I just meet some guy at a club is like, hey, let's go play heads up or whatever. Not really interested. You know what I mean? Because you never know with the money getting paid the whole nine yards. Right. What's your take real quick before we jump into the poker? And we got a lot of poker stuff for you. Uh, a guy like David Blaine, do you just roll your eyes? Did he hack to you? Or do you, uh, is there anything into his game that you respect? Uh, it, it, it seems like now he's mostly doing sort of tests of endurance, less magic. Well, I haven't followed any of his stuff for a long time. I met David Blaine a few different times, and he was he was kind of a prick. He was is short. Is that right? And, uh, not short as in short, but... He was just very short, like he just basically was like, I'm David Blaine and everyone else is, doesn't matter to me. And, you know, for me, I don't, I have no respect for someone like that. And so I haven't watched any of this stuff. But back in the day when I uh, saw his stuff, I thought it was great. Um, a lot of the magic that you see him do is not his magic. It's other people's magic that he was able to do and get on TV uh, and make himself famous for. Right. Um, 
But I don't want to take anything away from him. I think he's a great performer, and certainly his ability to do these incredible mental endurance, physical endurance things is amazing. Um, but as far as his, you know, I was a card guy. I was like a close-up magician guy. So to watch his handling of the cards and whatnot honestly doesn't impress me that much just because I know exactly what he's doing. Right. But some of the other stuff that he does is really, is really amazing to me. Right. But I don't know. I haven't seen his stuff in a long time. You're, you're a legendary epic partier. When you go out and about, we meet people all the time. Brett and I work in radio. We meet them all, rock stars, uh, athletes, you name them. Most of them typically don't like to talk to other dudes. They just want to holler at chicks. How, when you go out, is that your move, or will you talk and, and hang out and party with anybody? Well, I mean, Eric, I, you know, I prefer women <laughs> right? um, to hang out with. But at the same time, I think that I'm very lucky and fortunate to be able, you know, to live the life that I live and to be at the right place at the right time because it's nearly impossible to be uh, as lucky as I've been in life, basically. And so I feel like if I'm out and I'm having a couple drinks and, you know, there's a poker fan or, or someone out there that knows anything about poker that wants to come up and say hello or whatever – you know, the least I can do is be like, hey, have a drink, chill, you know, whatever. That's going to make his story back home a lot better. And plus, I don't mind a couple minutes of banter with random people. I love meeting people. I like chatting with people. So, um, you know, and luckily for me, the poker fame, to, to call it, is not over the top. It's nowhere near a famous person. So it's not like people are coming up to you and bothering you all the time. It'll happen a few times throughout the course of an evening, which is like the perfect perfect amount basically unfortunately the fans are never hot chicks they're always you know <laughs> guys so that's kind of tilting, but that's such yeah. is life i, I want to ask you about that because I, I imagine at the world series you get the hollywood style fame recognition when you're walking around the rio because there you are the days are long you're grinding it's not easy to to, to play those tournaments and then i imagine every 10 feet someone's stopping you for an autograph or a picture you know what's it like handling that at the World Series, it is uh, definitely a, a different league, um, and you kind of have to adjust to it. Uh, it's kind of like a maze, actually. There's a whole bunch of back door areas that people don't really hang out in, and so you can go to any room without really going through the uh, main hallways, and that's where you get stopped a lot. Um, you can also kind of just, you know, you just walk like you're on the phone and just have a mission to get somewhere, and they usually don't stop you. So it also kind of just depends on the mood. You know, if I just busted out of a tournament or something, I'm pretty tilted. I really don't want to talk to anybody. I'll kind of like just kind of duck my head and I'll just jam. But, you know, if I'm feeling good and, and whatever, I love talking to random people. Sometimes I'll even do magic tricks for the people. And so I don't mind um, so much. Just a part of the business, you know. So are you always walking around with a deck of cards? Is that basically the deal or no? I mean, I would almost bet you that in the next five years you could never – you can never see me and say, hey, do you have a deck? And I won't have one on me. Wow. Wow. That's pretty cool. Well, is That's that because cool. everywhere you go, you got well, a you backpack? No. I just, believe it or not, I keep my car. I hate things in my pockets, especially my front pockets, because I like, I like smoothicity, you know? <laughs> and so I put my cards in my, in my socks. You're kidding. I know it sounds kind of weird, but, yeah, in my socks, you can just hold it. You can hold anything, by the way, your car keys. Your wallet or whatever. It's better than your pockets. Right. And how, how, a lot of friends actually have started to do the same um, just because it's so annoying to have things in your pocket as a guy, you know? Right. Now, you've done a good job, actually an amazing job, sort of marketing yourself. You're known as the magician, uh, this sort of party guy, this ladies' man, uh, of course, a poker player. How much of this is really you and how much is is it – an image that you've sort of built up and calculated um, for yourself? What's well, an interesting question. Um, I honestly didn't go out of my way to promote or make myself a certain brand or anything like that. I kind of just live my life. Um, I honestly don't follow poker. So, you know, I've never been on a, a forum shop. I've never been a part of any kind of like, you know, click, I just kind of do my own thing. And so whatever image you see of me is what was naturally created. 
And yes, it's true. I love partying. Um, I used to like partying a lot more. I think in the last year, I probably booked the table in Vegas maybe twice, three times. I just don't go out as much anymore. But in my late 20s, I went out, gosh, I don't know, three, four nights a week hard. And there comes a point where you just kind of get over it. And it's sad to say, but it's approaching uh, <laughs> that time for me. I'm kind of just over going out. I'd, I'd love to, you know, I'm in no hurry by any means, but, you know, I got to think about kids and, and the whole family thing someday. And that's something that I've always wanted. Wait but a I second. I just wanted to make sure I got Wait all. Wait a second. You, hold on, hold on, hold on. out of the way. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh oh! I, I threw Eric for a little loop there. No, all right. Well, before before we started recording, just because I know people get tilted when I ask personal questions, Antonio said you can ask whatever you want. Fire away, okay? So all of the two plus tours right. are going to be tilted. So everybody knows. On. All right, you're a legendary ladies man. Everybody knows you write about it. You you got advice for going out, even though you're trying to act like you're growing up and you're out of it. Who in the poker world, bear with me here, has gotten more pussy than you? Is there anybody? Uh, Gus Hansen. For Gus sure? Gus Hansen. Yeah, because Gus will just, he's, he'll just, he, I'd like to say that I have a higher standard than Gus. <laughs> and Gus just does I love Gus, but he just doesn't give a, a shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I, I have certain standards. No matter how drunk I am, there's got to be a certain criteria that's got to be met. Um, so I would say Gus for sure. And I don't want to throw out any other names, but um, I, I mean, I'm not going to say I don't run good. I've, <laughs> I've, I run good. I've been very, uh, I've been very lucky. So, and then you just, and then you don't, the girls don't catch feelings. You don't date them for a period of time or they all know the deal. What's the story there? No, you know what? I'm really honest with girls uh, when I, uh, for the past, you know, few years and whatnot, any girl I've dated, I told her in the beginning that, look, I'm not looking for a relationship. I honestly think it's very difficult to be with one person your whole life. And right. I still believe that. And I will tell whoever I see next that as well. I do truly believe it. Um, almost every single person I know, whether it's a guy or a girl, is screwing around at some point. I mean, I've just seen so much... So much craziness in my life that I honestly just don't believe in it anymore. Right. And so I'd rather just be up front with somebody, you know what I mean? And just to, and just kind of say it, just throw it out there and see how it goes. And I can honestly tell you out of maybe 20 girls that I've had this conversation with, not one single one has said, okay, I don't want to see you anymore. Do you know what I mean? Wow. They're all – I just – they, well, they all, they all probably think, think they that, can change you. They all, they all think they can sort of mold you and change you and sort yeah, of force you into being monogamous I've, with them. I've certainly had some of that. And I'm not going to lie. There have been times in my life where I was with a certain girl for X amount of time. Um, but then again, I don't know if I could do it my whole life with somebody. And I just don't – I don't want to be the guy that comes home and is lying to my wife because that's my best friend. That's the person I'm supposed to grow old with and share a family with and whatnot. So before we get serious, there has to be some sort of a conversation about at some point, you know, down the line, um, I don't exactly know, but somehow, some way, hopefully the easiest solution will be is if she's into girls and we can just bring home a girl from time to time. I mean, <laughs> right. it's just... You know, How, I had that, that set up with natural. my ex-girlfriend, and it was the best. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What do you have more of? Do you have more caches at WSOPs or threesomes? Threesomes. I'll I got him on 13 caches. I got you. Wiki has oh, you on dude. 13 caches. He's probably at 30 threesomes. I'm going to, I, you know, I said you could ask anything, but I didn't say that I couldn't plead the fifth. So I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. So you can't say greater? You could just say greater. I won't pin you down. You know, this is one of those things where this is going to be digitally recorded forever. <laughs> and someday the girl, the girl that I'm going to marry is going to see this. And, you know. Who's to say I've had one threesome? Who knows? You know? Right. That's in here. So, 
Right. So well, if, what, a, what about what what about your boys? I mean, you take a look at Phil Lack. He's been dating the same chick forever. And uh, Brian Rast, I just did an interview with him. He's down in Brazil uh, with his fiance. Um, is, I lost is it one of these the things where every, I'm so sad about that. Everyone's getting wifed up, and uh, and you're still there hanging hanging tough, right? You know, I'm not hanging as tough as you would think. Um, I haven't been going out. I haven't been partying. Uh, I was seeing a girl recently. Um, you know, I kind of go through spurs. But, uh, yeah, my friends are kind of wifeyed up, but I have a bunch of other friends that are not, you know, poker players that you guys don't know. So having buddies to go out with is not uh, is not an issue. Now, I remember seeing... But, uh, yeah, I mean, Phil's been with... Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I no, remember no, seeing you... Been... <laughs> Phil and I... Phil and I were, like, the two greatest uh, ever. I mean, we used to just run around pre-poker anything it was just us two and we would drift around the world and have the greatest time ever it was so much fun um then of course he met jennifer and, and he left me and then it <laughs> took me a while to get over it but i got over it and then rasty i found another perfect go out great fun wingman guy and then um and then he left me too so you know you kind of go through your uh going out buddies um but those guys are my best friends. I'm going to have them forever, whether they have girlfriends, wives, or, or whatnot. But you just come to a certain point at a certain age where you got to throw in the towel. You right. know? And I'm approaching. Right. I'm not saying I'm throwing it in. I'm just saying that if the perfect girl came along, I would, I would lock it up because I need to have children. Well, if you're looking for the perfect girl, you're fine. Well, if you're looking for the perfect girl, you're fine. Right? Right. That's the, that's the hard thing is I've dated so many girls, and they all have – they're just one or two things that are crucial for me, and it just kind of kills it, right. you know. So it's kind of a bummer, but what can I do? All right, how have you stayed so relevant in the poker world? You know, every everybody's all about online now, and if you got to have this online resume, and you had to, you know, you know, earned eight million dollars in the cash games by age twenty to 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 have any respect. It seems like, you know, but yet you've got I don't know over five million dollars in live. You know, tournament caches, something like that. God only knows what, how you're doing in endorsements. Now you're doing commentating, which was killer, by the way, for the WSOP. I haven't seen a bad review yet of what you did there. Everybody seemed to love it. How have you stayed relevant sort of as a live poker guy? You know, I, I, I don't know. I never, I never really played Internet poker. I mean, I was endorsed by a couple sites, but even then when I played, I had to play for an hour and I had to play one, two, no limit. So I don't know. I just never got into it. I, you know, the couple times that I played high stakes online, I just honestly um, didn't think of it as money. It was just kind of pushing a button and I just couldn't get myself to grasp it. And for me, I think my biggest strength is just kind of reading people live. And I don't have any of that online. And so, for whatever reason, I just never got into it. You know, and Internet poker really got popular uh, maybe a year or two after I won the first WPT seven, eight years ago. And that was when I was kind of enjoying, you know, having freedom to live and party and go out. And so I was kind of overwhelmed with the enjoyment of life to concentrate on Internet poker. So I didn't really get into it. Hmm. Yeah, but I, ha I have to imagine you, you're, you're doing some serious work on your game because you can't just be thrusted into, say, high-stakes poker. And, you know, I sent you a tweet, and you responded actually a couple months ago, and you, you just play so solid, and you're, you're, you're there hanging and outplaying some of the best players in the world who are playing millions of hands, uh, you know, each and every year. You know, how are you doing I, that? Are you, I, I what kind of, what kind of work are you putting what... in? <laughs> it's so funny that you asked that question because I don't put any work in. I just, <laughs> when it's time to play poker, I just show up. I See, don't know. I you don't... just show up and you take, I swear to you, you just show up and take the money. You can ask, you can ask Phil Locke, Brian Rast. They're my best friends. They know I never put in the time. I, I must have played two cash games during the World Series this year and I just wasn't into it both times. I honestly just don't, I don't care about poker. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I never talk about poker outside of poker. These guys are talking about. I still honestly don't know what, uh, you know. I just learned what UTG plus one means. You know, <laughs> um, high jack, low jack. 
Right. All that crap is all new to me. Yeah, but hold on. And so a lot of a lot of my buddies. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I think you're full of shit. This is why. Because I heard stories, epic stories. Okay. You, you and Phil flying okay. around. You go to Macau. You're in Baltimore a couple months ago. You swoop in on a on a local game <laughs> and you fleece See, him. Know about that. You fleece <laughs> him for a couple hundred k and fly back. This bullshit. You don't work on your game or you're not playing yeah, the cash. But, but so you're so you're so you're saying that if I flew to Baltimore one time and <laughs> played in one cash game, when I got kidnapped by. A, a, a buddy of mine who had a jet ride at 4 a.m. after a long night of drinking, and we go to play poker the next day, is working on my game. Is that what you call working on your game? Because I don't call that working on my game. I call working on my game studying and, like, playing a lot of hands online and talking about poker. But, you know, do I play cash? Yeah, once, twice a month I'll show up at a good game and I'll play. Right. But I don't consider that working on your game. I consider that going to the office. Right. Do you go to the office all around the world, uh, you know, on a, uh, the drop of a hat when you hear of a good game? No. I, I honestly, uh, it's very rare that I would fly to a different city for a poker game. I would go for poker tournaments because you kind of have to follow the circuit in order to keep your name out there. Um, there's one game in particular that I've flown to a couple times to play in it. Uh, but even then, I have friends in the town and a little bit of social life. So specifically for me to fly to a poker game would, would be a, a rarity. Hmm. Well, are you ever worried about, okay, you know, wh- where's my income going to come from five years down the road? Or are you confident you could just show up once or twice a month and, and beat these big games and live comfortably off that? Well, if you know any poker player that has had any success and built a bankroll and didn't do something with their money in the meantime, then you know they're not as they're, they're not as smart as you would think. I don't rely just on playing poker to make a living. I have other things that I you know dabble in, and uh, I would probably go as far as telling you that poker is probably not my main source of income. Mm. Can you talk about sort of your other business ventures? Like real estate? What, what do you uh, got? I mean, I don't want to get into it too much. Real estate? Yeah, I got, I got, I did real well in real estate. <laughs> Buy real estate, Antonio. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot, guys, for that advice. Um, no, I, uh, just different investments and whatnot. I don't really want to get into it too much, but I have access to some of the smartest brains out there that I have met, uh, throughout my time. And so anytime, an investment opportunity comes up, I basically just send it over to my guys and they look over it and about one in 10 times they say, go for it. And I go for it. And so there's a lot of things that are basically pending for years to come. Some are, you know, one, some are five, some are 10 year investments. And whether or not they come back or not, uh, who knows? But I'm hoping that at the end of the day, they come back well. And I, and I suspect that they will. So. But as far as, you know, everyday spending, life, and whatever, um, you know, I don't know. I've, I've been very lucky in life. It's, hmm. I was, you know, I came into poker when poker was in need of, you know, poker stars. And so, you know, if I'd come in two, three years later, it would be very difficult to be where I am today. So I'm just really fortunate that I was at the right place at the right time. You ever play in those, uh, those cash games out in Hollywood with Tobey Maguire and, and Ben Affleck and all those guys? I know you've played with them on the sort of the celebrity circuit. You've seen them out in Vegas. Did you ever play in any of the home games with those guys? Um, I'd actually rather not answer that question for a couple of different reasons. Wow. Which, well, let's say this. Which of the celebrities that we know about... Uh, are the best poker players out there? Everybody says Tobey Maguire. Is that true? Is he the best of the celebs? Um, Toby's pretty good. Uh, I haven't played with him in a while, but when I used to play with him back in the day, he was pretty good. He didn't like to give anything away. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say that Ben was probably the loose, loosey-goosey. He was pretty loose and pretty crazy. And, um, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll leave it at that. Huh. What about And Rick Solomon's got a lot better, which is annoying. Right. <laughs> what about uh 
like, I, you know, I was out in Vegas and I saw Phil grinding. I think it was like a 1020 no limit game at the Bellagio, just sitting there at the table. I mean, is, is that is book, that something? Being on his iPad. Yeah, he's got his headphones on. Yeah, like what? What is? You're what does he about, need to play? Phil Locke. What does he need to play? Ten twenty four. He he is something else. I mean, I love the guy, but he on some levels, I just don't understand what is going through his brain. I mean, I have no idea why he's at the casino playing ten twenty no limit. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I guess I guess it has a lot to do with with being domesticated on some level. You know, you're when you're in love, you're happy and. You know, you're just kind of living and you're at home with nothing to do. You might as well go down and play some poker. Hey, that's the only game. You know, a lot of it could be because he's waiting for a bigger game to go down. And a lot of times if you're at the Bellagio in the poker room, things develop. While you're there, you you, you know, you have a much better chance at getting a seat. He's a hard worker, Phil Luck, you know. you got to respect that. I, am, I My work ethic, if his is 100, mine is about a 7. <laughs> <laughs> You've played with all of the all of the great ones, certainly all of the well known live and online guys. Most of them I assume you've played in, in a live setting. We've watched you. Who's the smartest poker player you've ever played with? I know that Phil Locke is a genius, he certainly seems like it, but everybody always answers this question and they say Phil Galfond. It's funny, you were in a way it felt like you were leading the witness there after you said Phil Galfond because I was probably going to say Phil Galfon. I mean, I haven't spent much time with him, but from the amount of time that I have spent with him, um, really impressed with this kid. I mean, not only is his poker just on a different level, but uh, he's incredibly humble, which I really appreciate about him. And he's just he's just he's just a bright dude. Him and Durr, I actually think Durr is is pretty bright, but he's kind of like really like out there on, on, on both different fronts. I mean, Durr is so smart with so many things, but on a, a couple of Laden Things questions, his answers were so off. I'm like, wow, he's clueless. But when it comes to poker, I think he's an, he's an absolute machine. Who do you like to watch on TV? Like Poker-wise. Uh, you'll be shocked. I honestly, I honestly almost never watch poker on TV. If you were going to watch so, high-stakes poker or something, a cash game, who would you watch? I mean, I, I, I love watching Durr play. I like watching Ivy play. Um, obviously, these guys are just, you know, on a sick level, and it's just very amazing to watch them play with uh, with absolutely no fear. And I'd like to say that, you know, I have the capability of playing on that level, but when the stakes are so high, when the stakes are half a million dollars a decision, you know, no, I don't have the balls to play like them because I care about the money more than they do is probably the case. But, you know, if we were to step it down to like a 25, 50, 50, 100, maybe even a 100, 200, I play so much different than you see me playing at 300, 600 no limit game. Mm -hmm. What about, you mentioned your work ethic is like a seven, but here you are on ESPN putting in like 12, 14 hour days. How much work? How much work how was much that work, for you to? Uh, for you to uh, I'm kind of hearing a feedback. How, how much? How much work was that for one? And, and two, your analysis was very sharp. You did a great job balancing sort of not being too geeky, but yet giving poker fans enough analysis to appreciate. You had to have put time and in, in work into in, into those broadcasts, correct? Um. I put zero time and effort into it. I didn't do one <laughs> second of studying or research. Or I, I would go as far as I didn't even know who the players were deep in the tournament. I just showed up, and I went into the booth, and they gave me the thing, and I and they said go. And I, you know, that's just me. I'm really bad at studying up and following up and knowing, who, you know, who what is. And I, I should have done that. And going further down the um, – the show, like on day four when it was for ESPN flagship, when it was on ESPN one, and it was only on that channel for two hours. You know, the day before I actually went, I went to the tournament and I kind of watched a little bit just to see the action so that when it got to the flagship, when I was on there commentating, I would have some knowledge of how the players played before to get to where they were. Um, I, I, I felt like there was a lot of value in it. I never thought the commentary thing would be as big as it was. I mean, not in a million years that I think it would be 
it would be so good. I mean, it was huge for my career, honestly. It was bigger than winning the WPT in December. What what has happened since? That? Yeah, what's happened since? Um, I don't know. I, I guess just a lot of respect. Um, a lot of people were very impressed. I guess. I mean, this is what this is just the feedback that I heard. Uh, I certainly don't want to sound too arrogant, but they just told me they were very impressed with the reads and the way I described the hands, and that um, to the average player who wasn't an, an avid hardcore poker fan, they actually understood the things that I was talking about, um, and that they liked to watch the show. I mean, I was really happy. The feedback that I got, um, especially on the social media networks, was just was huge. Um, even ESPN told me that on their social media networks, the responses for my commentary was through the roof. And so I was very honored to be picked as the commentator with Lon for the one two-hour segment that was on ESPN. Very that was nice. huge for me. Very nice. And I have to say, you're a total natural. I know how it can be when that red light's on. Some people can't shine. Some people shrink. You didn't seem to be bothered by that at all. Total natural. So congratulations. I know you want to mention your uh, your Twitter feed again. You're in this chase to catch Phil. He's got you by about six thousand followers, though. This should be doable. Yeah. It hurts to think that Phil Locke has more followers. I honestly don't even care about that kind of stuff. I didn't. Even, I don't even have a Facebook really. Um, but you know, I started my Twitter account, and then Phil started his a little bit after me, and I was crushing him. <laughs> And then he broke the world record. And while he was breaking the world record, his Twitter followers just went through the roof. Right. And so since then, I've been way behind. And it just hurts when Phil's better at something, you know? <laughs> so um, he's my best friend, but he's been holding over me my, our whole life. And you can ask him. I If it's a 50-50 Phil Locke and Antonio, it's l literally more like an 80-20 Phil. <laughs> so for that reason... I just want to I just want to pass him on Twitter and I think I'm at 31 he's around 37 or something so it's magic yeah, antonio magic antonio magic. right yes uh, hey hey are you going to be calling the uh the November 9 final table or November whatever whatever it's called have they asked I, you I don't know if they ask me of course I mean that's a huge thing that I I certainly couldn't say no to I uh, promised one of my very good friends, uh, my roommate actually, Lee, um, that I would give him one month to go wherever he wanted in the world and live however he wanted. And the reason for this is because about three years ago, he and his girl broke up and he just decided to go drift around South America, literally living uh, as a homeless person half the time, uh, backpacking, not spending a dollar, like making beads and selling it on the street. Just total, you know, grasping what life is really about. And I've been very accustomed to a certain lifestyle. I've become accustomed to a very certain type of lifestyle the last few years, given the, you know, success and uh, whatever poker has enabled me to do so. So, you know, not to say that I've lost touch of what's important, but I think it's really important sometimes to just kind of cleanse yourself. And I think that one month backpacking, you know, living on the street, just drifting around South America would be very good for me. And so I promised my friend that I would do this with him. Wow. And the only time that it really fit into my schedule was November. And so if they ask me to do this commentary, um, it's going to be a real bummer because I can't say no to the commentary, but I gave my friend my word. So I'm going to have to come up, come out with a some sort of a solution him and I can come up with to go maybe a little bit later or whatever. But this is a trip that I'm really looking forward to, mm. like really big time. Living in hostels, totally bumming it. Wow. Hey, how did Norm and Chad take, uh, you know, ESPN bringing you in? Because he's a poker player himself. He, he, you know, he's made some nice runs. I'm sure he plays cash games as well. He plays all the games. Uh, was it a little awkward when he was there, sort of almost like the sidekick or sideline reporter? Not really, um, because I, I didn't take Norman Chad's place by any means. I mean, the show that Lon and Norman do is entirely different than what Lon and I did. Their show is still intact. They're still going to do Tuesday nights on ESPN. They're still going to broadcast the show like they always do. Um, this was just, it was so different. It was a live stream of what was happening at that very moment. 
and they needed some in-depth poker analysis, I guess. And, you know, Norman is a very funny commentator. I love him on the poker shows. He's great. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he wasn't interested in doing what, uh, you know, Olivier, myself, or Helmuth, or, or the other guys were doing. I don't even know how that came to be. But for me, it was nice when he came in the booth. It was just kind of a, a little change of energy. Um, it was nice to have him in there. He's a funny guy. Hmm. And, you know, earlier you said you didn't know what, you know, UTG, under the gun plus one, all that stuff. You don't know what any of that stuff is, but yet you sit there on ESPN and you got to talk your way through a 12-minute decision, fill that time, give appropriate analysis, try to be right. Uh, I mean, how, how did you do that, or did it something that came natural? Well, you know, talking my way through the I – mean, I mean, I, I think you're referring to the one hand that was 10 minutes. It was Matt Gianetti uh, yeah. against Ben Lamb's bet on the river. And I'm glad that I called it right because <laughs> that was the longest hand of the show on mm -hmm. ESPN. And, you know, when I say I called it right, I, I don't want to sound egotistical. I didn't exactly call it right, but if you go back and listen to the 10 minutes, I pretty much – my final decision was that, you know, Ben had this and, and Matt had this, and I was pretty close to right. Um, anyway, you can explain that stuff without knowing the terminology. You know, what, what the player at home is going to know what UTG plus one is? No. You know, <laughs> I, I, I don't even know what that stuff really is. I mean, you know, I, I know, I honestly, I know under the gun plus one, under the gun, and is it is the next one UTG plus two? I don't know that spot. Yeah, I think so. You Depends. Know? Yeah. Depends <laughs> okay, if you're six so max. UTG plus two. Right, right, right. So I don't know. I, you know, it was just natural, and, and and honestly, I'm getting a lot of credit, but I would have zero chance to do what I did without Lon McCarron. I mean, he was he is so freaking good at just saying what needs to be said and keeping the audience in, uh you know tuned in i mean he he knows where to go and without him i would I, I would be completely worthless all right well well listen antonio you've been amazing we made you wait for 15 or 20 minutes or so because brett got stuck in traffic i know you have to run yeah, I, had a I, had a, I, I had a big time you antonio yeah <laughs> exactly hey, it's all good you know all right. Keep me waiting 25 minutes. No problem. <laughs> All right. Well, we want to do this again sometime. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we love watching you play. And I don't know. Keep doing your, your thing, whatever the hell that is. It doesn't include preparing. <laughs> it doesn't include playing poker. But keep doing it, man. You're, you're killing it. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Okay. All right. Peace, buddy. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you.